So welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Andy Lustigman. I'm an attorney at the firm of Olshan. I guess I should say hashtag sponsored. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, a number of issues that affect both brands, creators, and agencies with respect to sponsored social. What I do is I'm trying to help clients get their message out in a legally defensible way. I'm not the person that just says no. We try to work around to say, how can we do this um, in terms of meeting your legal responsibilities? Today, I'm joined with uh, Suzanne Fanning from the Word of Mouth Association, Word of Mouth Marketing Association, sorry about that, Lauren Thomas from Cricket Wireless, uh, Jen Berg from the Suburban Mom, and Sadie Jane from Simply Sadie. Jane.com. Um, Suzanne, you want to give a, a brief intro in terms of uh, what does WOMA do? Sure, nice crowd. Hi, everybody. My name is Suzanne Fanning, and I am the president of the Word of Mouth Marketing Association, known to our friends as WOMA. We are a nonprofit trade association for the social media and word of mouth marketing industries, and we focus on ethics, advocacy, and education. Prior to joining WOMA, I actually worked for several large global corporations, and I did run their influencer campaigns as part of my job in marketing communications. So I've been on all sides of the issues, and I'm very delighted to be here today. Thank you. Lauren? So hello, my name is Lauren Thomas. I lead national social media marketing for Cricket Wireless. At Cricket, we're really dedicated to providing first-class wireless experiences for our consumers at affordable prices with no annual contracts. Now, before I joined Cricket, I worked at a variety of social and digital marketing agencies, and I had the pleasure and privilege of working with a wide variety of companies, from mom and pop shops to Fortune 500 brands. Um, in case you're wondering, yes, this is my real hair. <laughs> but no, you cannot touch it. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, my perspective on this in this panel. Thank you. Jen? Hey, I'm Jen Berg from The Suburban Mom, which is a lifestyle blog about all things about being a mom and living in suburbia, lots of crafts and food and recipes, recipes, food, parties, that kind of thing, all about um, my life with my two little girls and my husband um, here in Orlando, Florida. So thank you. And Sadie? My name is Sadie Jane, and I am the owner of SimplySadieJane.com. I started as a labor and delivery nurse and just writing about my journey, and now I talk primarily about fitness and lifestyle as well, so you can get everything from my fashion to my fitness. I love talking about um, my journey of losing 80 pounds and then doing it at home, using my kids as weights and doing playground workouts, making myself look like an idiot. I really love doing that, so make myself relatable. Um, just talking about everyday life, but in a little bit more of a fun context, and that's me. Great, great. Thanks, everybody. So these people just ate lunch, and so what they really want to hear about is sort of what the do's and don'ts are in the law. That's, I, know, I know that's the top of their mind. Um, we heard a lot this morning about FTC compliance and regulatory compliance, typically with, uh, most importantly, with the state of sponsored social. Um, Suzanne, what are some of the key things that creators and brands need to keep in mind when engaging in sponsored social from a compliance standpoint? I think if we kind of break it down to the one most important thing, it's really not complicated. In fact, it's something that you learned way back in kindergarten, and it's be honest. I mean, that's the most important thing. If you're being paid to say something, just make it clear to the consumer, because it's our job as content providers and as, as brands to make sure that we're building that bridge of trust between consumers and brands. We don't want it to be broken down because then uh, you know, it's gonna be horrible for you, it's gonna be horrible for the brand, and it's really bad for the consumer. So all we have to do is make sure that we are being honest and transparent in everything that we do. Yeah. Lauren, what else would you uh, recommend that creators and brands need to keep in mind with respect to posts and from a legal compliance standpoint? I think the big thing um, from an FTC standpoint is that it's really important that whenever you are sharing content on behalf of a brand, that you're really clear and conspicuous about the relationship with that brand, right? And that applies whether you're an employee at the company, whether you're an agency who works for the company, or whether you're a creator developing content on behalf of the brand, that you're really open about whatever the connection is with the brand that may lead you to have some kind of bias 
in favor of the brand. Um, I think another key thing to keep in mind is that as a creator, you cannot say anything about the company or their products that they cannot legally say. So for a nutrition company, for example, you could make a claim like this will help you lose 20 pounds if that's not typical of the product or if that's not a claim they can verify. How about monitoring? To what extent do brands have an obligation to monitor what's being said by their sponsored uh, social creators? So every brand that I've worked with, we do tend to monitor all the content our influencers create, right? So we're looking for things like, are they following our legal guidelines? If they're using any claims about our products or services, is it a claim that we can substantiate? So we do tend to check all the content that comes from our creators about our products to make sure that everything is um, above board. Good. Now, um, Jen and Sadie, Suzanne talks about you know, being honest, being transparent. How do, how do you go about disclosing that to your, to your followers while at the same time being genuine? What's, what, what are some of the things that you try to do? Sure, I think in, in the long form blog post, um, the, the easiest and the most, most on, on, authentic, <laughs> authentic I can't even speak, um, way of, being, of disclosing is to actually weave it into what you're talking about. Um, not everything has to be you know, as black and white as right up front saying, this is sponsored by. You can weave it into a nice conversational tone where you're saying, you know, you know, I was I was given these products or I was I've been brought on board to talk about or something like that. Just like you were talking to a person, you know, the whole point is to let people know that you're, you know, being sponsored or you've gotten these things, but you can do it in a conversational way. Yeah. But the important thing to remember too is that you have to do it on all of your Absolutely. platforms. Yeah. So you have a shorter time in some of the other platforms. And the thing about Isaiah that's so great is they, I mean, you guys know this, they are giving it to us anyway. I mean, we literally have to do nothing but give the creative content of why they're give, that's why you have been chosen for this campaign anyway. And so it's cut and dry with them. Another way though, like- uh, Can you Jen, expand on that? Yeah, I mean, cut and dry as in like, you guys have seen the platform and if you haven't worked with them, oh, you're gonna begin to because you're at the conference, but um, it says, you know, this is sponsored by and it has the options that are given to you and then it has everything laid out for you when you're doing the Instagram or doing the Facebook or Twitter, please mention or add this, like for Twitter, for example, make sure the ad is before the link, the ad actual word. Um, what's great though is if you do work with a brand specifically and not use Isaiah, um, you have more of a little bit, um, you can do it your own way, like you were saying in the beginning. Oh, I'm, I, this is such a great opportunity to work with this clothing company. I am just so excited to promote this. I'm so excited to talk about this with you. I'm so excited to show you how I styled this jacket. Um, I mean, you really can make it your own, but what's, like I said, great about Isaiah, it's so cut and dry. And you just don't touch it. Don't how even about, worry about that. How about the different, the different platforms? So you talk about blogs or, or yeah. Twitters. Twitter feeds, what about videos? You know, how, do you, how do you work that into yeah, videos? And then they've, they've recently said that you know, just having a description within your YouTube page or something like that isn't enough. enough. Yeah. The disclosure has to be of the equal level of what you're video. watching. So yeah. it needs to be in the video or it needs to be um, you know, incorporated, talked, about the talked about in the beginning yeah. and before all of the Yeah, content. and I mean, safe. Better safe than sorry, and so always beginning is better. You can think about it that way. And like most of the time, if you're doing a YouTube video, I would think you'd be writing text on the screen anyway um, on your video. So you can put it right in there, right after you put your website, right after you put your name. Um, like she said, it's not good enough anymore for the YouTube standpoint to just put it in your description. And as far as going along with that, I mean, there's different facets of how to do that and regulations, not just for regulating your sponsored content, but the content you put out in general that could go against um, the FTC as far as giveaways um, or reviews on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and I think we're gonna talk more about that. Yeah, and it's been talked about earlier today too. It's not just when you're given money. A coupon is considered yeah. something that you are getting in order to put this out there. And so the product that you're or product, yeah. a product or a coupon for it. Um, and so whatever you choose as disclosure, even if it's in 140 characters and a Twitter, you, you need to have ad or sponsored yeah. or something else. And it has to come before they could be directed away with a link. So we're yeah. not talking the entire tweet and then the link 
and then, oh, by the way, this is sponsored. It has to come before somebody could be directed somewhere else with yeah. a link. And I don't, I mean, like we said before, I don't care if it's a piece of gum or if it's a whole bedroom makeover. Like, whether you're getting something or even getting paid for it, anything that you're getting to talk about, you just want to be safe. Always put that in there, always. And like we said at the beginning, you can add something that it seems more organic, that flows better. Um, it doesn't have to be so complicated. And I think the most important thing that all of us talked about in the back is that not only is this what you're being told to do by the FTC, but also it is, it's the best way to protect your integrity as a blogger, as a creator, by telling your readers, telling your viewers, this is where it came from. You know, I mean, yeah. you want to be open and let them know that this is, this is what's happening. You know, you're not trying to hide what's going on in your life. People, people should understand that, yes, you're making money from this, or yes, you're getting product. So you should want to put that out there as, you know, the, this is what's happening. Put the information out there yeah. and just be honest with people. If you tell them what's going on, you're, then you're doing the right thing. So, so they mentioned disclosure. It seems to be a, the, big, the big thing about disclosing, disclosing the relationship, and that's key thing from the Federal Trade Commission's perspective. To, to what extent do you think that there's a negative feedback from uh, someone disclosing that it's sponsored, from an influencer disclosing something sponsored or an advertisement? Suzanne? I don't think there is any negative feedback. I mean, again, like we said, honesty is always the best policy, and you should disclose every time. And if you have to question, should I disclose this, the answer is yes, you should disclose yeah. it. You should just go ahead and do it. And you know, again, we were, we were definitely all in agreement about that. Um, and we were also talking about the fact that it's not just even disclosing that you have like the relationship, it's also making sure that you're giving a true review, something that is your true opinion, and it's not just fluff. And we have study after study that actually indicates a little bit of negative in that positive review makes it quite a bit more credible. So uh, we were giving, talking about the example of shoes, because we're all big fans of shoes. Uh, and we said, all right, I was actually just looking on a website last week, and it said, these shoes are absolutely gorgeous, but they kind of hurt your feet at the end of a long day. So I went, OK, well, I um, just want to wear them to a party, so I'm willing to take that paint. If I, in turn, had actually bought the shoes and I didn't see that review, I would probably be kind of mad at the store and I'd be like, man, these things are uncomfortable. So in a way, you giving your honest opinion um, really does help you, helps the consumer, and helps the brand. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, okay. I, going back to the beginning when you said the disclosure thing, as far as a brand, you probably don't see any negative. In fact, it's so much better for you as far as communication goes but as a blogger. I've, I don't know if you, about you guys, but for sure I've seen negativity. People are like, another sponsored post. And it's annoying. It's a little bit annoying for us. But what's great is it gets you, your, your readers get over it. Your followers, your readers will get over it. And I don't care if it's negative for them. If you're giving content that is organic and it's just, if not, if not as good or better than your normal posts that aren't sponsored, they're not going to care anymore. So you have to gain that trust in relationship with your readers to know that it, I don't care if it's a sponsored post, it's still going to be just as great. Because there are people out there that are going to, they're going to take every single one that they can. They're going to do any kind of sponsored post that they want. But you need to gain a relationship so that it's not negative for them. Because whether we like it or not, we have to put it in there. So there's just no skirting around it. You know, a, a trial attorney that I, uh, I admire, an old trial attorney, he taught me early on, when you have a negative fact, the best thing you can do is embrace it and make yes. that fact yeah. yours. Negative and, feedback is actually a gift sometimes. You know, and, and it makes, and it, and it goes media to... media is good, media. Lauren, I, I interrupted you. Yeah, I've got a different perspective on this from the brand side. I think, like Suzanne was saying, one key is when in doubt, disclose. Right, I know I've worked with some high profile celebrities who feel like adding a hashtag ad or hashtag sponsored isn't authentic to their voices. And I think there's a way to still be open and transparent in a way that works for you. Saying, you know, thanks Cricket for sponsoring me, right? You might not have to add hashtag sponsored at the end, but you're still making it clear in a way that works for you. I've also been watching the space for a long time, and I know that sometimes when influencers do begin to work with brands in a way that's sponsored, um, sometimes you get negative flack for selling out. Right? Yes. And I think one point of that is it's just something that you're leveling up. You know, yeah. the higher that you grow and you go, you do get more haters. But I think in the long term, if you're looking at building authentic relationships with your readers, giving your authentic opinions, yeah. um, I wouldn't worry about it, right? As long as you're no. being true to yourself and true to your brand yeah. and creating great content, 
Um, don't worry about what people say you're selling out. I think you've seen that across the board from celebrities to social networks, right? And they're still growing and shining, and you can do the same in a way that's open. And I think it's, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Pay, uh, piggybacking on that of if you're going to do it and not disclosing, and, and if you are this, this sensation, I have seen Instagrammers who have this you know, big following, and all of a sudden they started doing ads. Their readers aren't stupid. And all of a sudden they see these ads, and they will call you out mm -hmm. and say, you didn't disclose that. So mm -hmm. here you are selling out, and you're trying to lie to us yeah. and not tell us. So I've seen flack actually come from readers who understand and consumers that understand that this is yeah. an ad. So yeah. if you're making the decision that you are going to do sponsored social, then regardless of what may or may not come at the end of the day, you're going, you need to disclose because it's the right thing to do yeah. and people will recognize that. And you were saying how you know ad and sponsored, those specific terms. Now, some social media assets or facets actually give you a little bit of leeway, whether you believe it or not. So like Jen and I were talking about the difference between ad and hashtag ad. On Instagram, there's really not different, not a difference. So for me, I actually prefer it and it flows better and maybe looks a little bit more organic if I put hashtag ad, hashtag fitness, hashtag outfit of the day, hashtag SS Jane Fitness. You know what I'm saying? Like, like make it blend. And maybe Jen doesn't use hashtag. I'm sure she does, but with that specific post, she wouldn't, so she would just use ad. There are ways to make it look more organic with you. you now, we're talking about the disclosure obligation, typicality. Is this all just the lawyers getting everybody crazy, or has there been real action by regulators with respect to sponsored social? There is absolutely real action that's been happening, and it's been happening with some giant. Am I allowed to like name names of these cases? It's public. Because it's yeah. public <laughs> record, OK? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've seen some major cases actually happen with Sony and with Microsoft because they failed to have their folks disclose. Um, and there were reviews and posts and everything going up that didn't disclose about some of their, their gaming systems. We've seen Cole Haan get in some serious trouble. I mean, they're coming down. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of where does the buck stop? Uh, and content creators, maybe you're feeling like it's the brand, and brands are saying, oh, I can't keep up with what all the content creators are doing. Um, the truth is, and I think we, we all agree with this, like, and maybe we can say it on the count of three, like, who is responsible for disclosure? One, yeah. two, three, everybody. everybody. Right, yeah. all of us are. Um, what has been happening, though, uh, most recently is the fact that they are going back to the companies. They're issuing letters to the companies, and then the companies are managing their content providers. Honestly, I don't know that that's always going to be the case. I mean, I think that they're going to start cracking down on some of the content providers. That would be my prediction. Uh, we've seen these giant cases. Uh, we've seen millions of dollars actually recovered because of these cases. Uh, and right now, we're seeing even more guidelines coming out. Uh, I have it on some good authority that the FTC is going to release some new guidelines on native advertising within the year. When we see a huge flurry of these guidelines being released by governing bodies, that means they're really getting ready to crack down. So yeah. it is important for you to understand these laws, know these laws, and follow these laws. Well, and to piggyback on that, um, they're different for every social media outlet. And so, like, I don't know if you guys knew this, this is actually just new for Instagram like within the last week, but if you're going to do a giveaway, you can't have people tag people. It's actually not allowed anymore. And I mean, I had no idea. In fact, a friend actually just told me about it, and then I was like, oh, I better go read up on that too. So that, sometimes the creator is going to want, or the brand is going to want to do, let's do a giveaway. Those are so great. That'll get more awareness for both of us. But as a creator, I've got, it. this is my, like, baby and it's going to come back on me if I if they had found out that I had done a giveaway and tagged people and they saw that they could shut me down for a week on Instagram I mean they could have only done it for a couple hours but they're going to make up their point if they find me and it, the bigger and bigger you get the more transparent you are to them and the more they're going to watch you so you can actually there's policies that you can read up on it's annoying but it's, it's necessary especially if you're going to do this for your business and you can even Google all of them too. What's the, the what's the newest policies for Twitter? And you know, let me just jump in on that too. I mean, there are resources to help you. Uh, you can definitely go to the FTC website because they list out their guidelines and they uh, publish the speeches that they've given so you can actually see all of the actions that have occurred in the past few months. There are other resources because sometimes the FTC uh, will come out with a guideline that's 58 pages and maybe that is a little bit hard to kind of take in before you're getting ready to do a blog post about new baby formula, right? Um, but 
uh, WOMA actually has a legal affairs committee that breaks it down to a two-page document with, okay, we took it and we made it very brief. Here are the, you know, the, the two-sheeter of what you need to know to stay out of trouble. The IAB actually has some great resources where they've done the same thing. They've created guidelines, they've done their own studies. So these trade organizations can actually be a great resource to you as well. I would, I would recommend that you take a look. The Federal Trade Commission this summer came out with social media guidelines, sort of an explanation of the testimonial and endorsement guides, taking a lot of the things that creators and brands are doing, they break it down between creators, brands, affiliate marketers, and really trying to walk through. I would, I would warn you, there's some ambiguity and lack of clarity in it, so it's, it's better to also go to these other sources, but it's, it's certainly something worth looking at. But you know what, it's not, just, it's not just the Federal Trade Commission that's out there, right? That's great. I mean, you have other regulatory bodies, and yes. what would social media be without Kim Kardashian? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good example. She did get into a little bit of trouble there, I'm sure. Everybody heard about what Kim Kardashian actually did. Uh, she actually posted about a morning sickness drug that she was using, and she did not indicate Kim's that pregnant? She, she, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, she did not disclose that there was a financial relationship with her and this drug company. And so again, who did they come down on? Well, they actually did come down on the drug company, but Kim did remove all of her posts. Well, and not I, only did that, they didn't do that. They, she didn't disclose any of the side effects, any of the, I mean, how long have we been watching TV and we get those commercials about a new drug and right. the last 30 seconds are, oh, it could kill you. Oh, it could give you a seizure. I mean, they're so ridiculous, but that's not new for anybody. So right. nobody should, if I'm going to do, and I do a lot of health posts and I work with a lot of food companies even, the FDA is just as a stickler as the FT, uh, a, FTC. FTC. Guys, I, yes. <laughs> I know what they are, I promise. Anyway, um, they're, they're going to be just as a sticklers, and so that's why she had to take it off, and she had to specifically write, I mean, it was like literally two pages long. This could cause this, and this, and this. And I mean, you cannot, it goes back to, I don't know if we've talked about claims yet, but we, you can't claim things. And there are going to be posts that you guys write, and the brands should, the brands, if you're working with them, if they're a drug company or a food company or any kind of health or wellness, they know the FTA, they know them well, and so they're gonna make sure that they give you the guidelines that you need. And if they don't, you ask them, because there are some claims you can't make. Like if I'm working with a cookie company, I probably shouldn't put in their nutritious or healthy, and they're gonna have that. Now that doesn't mean that I can't add, oh my gosh, they're so good and I love them as a midnight snack. Like you can still make it positive, but just don't add those, those words in there. And then if they're asking you to put this much of content, on the bottom of your blog post about drug side effects, you better believe you are because you're going to get paid for that and it's going to save your behind in, in so the, the end. So the key thing to keep in mind is right, that a sponsored post is going to be viewed by a regulator as an advertiser. Oh, yeah. right. And right. even if Kim is going to be talking about her morning sickness medicine and it's her own genuine experience and her genuine thoughts with it, it still has to be evaluated by the brand as, this, this is an, as being an advertisement. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how brands can help creators and creators can be helped in terms of making claims that are permissible, consistent yeah. with what a brand could say. Lauren, how does, how does Cricket and how do you handle uh, when you want to get your message out but otherwise being consistent with what you can say, with, with what Cricket can say? Yeah, of course. I think one big picture to keep in mind here is that what we're really seeing is that the creator economy and the state of sponsored social is evolving so quickly. Um, and with that complexity comes confusion in the market, right? So what the FTC is trying to do is protect consumers and make sure that they are empowered and given all the information they need to make really informed decisions. So from a brand perspective, I think it's really important when you're working with creators to be upfront as possible in the beginning about what the guidelines and guardrails are. So laying out what are the approved claims you can use, what are the approved disclaimers, what situations require a disclaimer. So if you're a food company, maybe if they mention any weight loss claims or anything to do with nutrition, that triggers a need for this disclaimer. In my end for telecommunications, if we talk about pricing or coverage, there are certain approved claims and disclaimers we have to use, and including all of that up front in the brief really helps the influencers when they're creating content to think in a way that's creative, but also allows them to play within the legal restrictions we have because the FTC does require anything that's an ad, whether it's a billboard or a TV spot or a sponsored tweet, to have the same level of transparency for consumers. 
right? So being and, upfront and going in. And from the in. creator standpoint, when brands and marketers tell you upfront, this is the rules you have to play by, we love that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, tell me, I'm not the expert in your field, you are. So if you can give me those guidelines that are specific to your stuff before I start creating my content, love it versus you know us going back and forth later and you being like oh you can't say that you you can't do that you can't do that i, 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 I don't know that so things yeah. like what lauren's talking about providing to creators are valuable to the brand and the marketer because you get the right message and they're valuable to the creator because you're doing it once and you're doing it the way it needs to be done so that everybody's protected so, so jen what about that. provided <laughs> content is that what you're saying i'm you, sorry you want to get provided content no i don't want provided content i definitely want to be free to do my own content, but give me the guidelines as to if there's something I can't say, or yeah. the guidelines of, you know, if you do say this, you have to make sure you say that, that kind of thing. But definitely allowing creators to be creative in their own field mm -hmm. and to reach their target audience in the best way that they know how is going to be most beneficial for the brand as well. Just, just give me the guidelines, just like what you were saying. And I think to that point, one of our goals is to have really great relationships with our influencers, right? So if I say up front, this is what I'm looking for, it empowers you to deliver that in a way that works for you. You know your audience best. We're looking to you for your creativity and your thoughts. So if we can work together to find the win-win, you bring your great ideas and your great content, and I'll bring the swim lanes. Um, yeah. I think that creates the best results long term. Yeah. And I, I love the example, actually, when we were discussing in the back, and, and we were talking about, well, if you were a playground company and you were giving information about a playground, she might write a post about how you can go to the playground and you can do all these health things with your kids and all that sort of stuff. I might write about just being there with my kids and making memories and stuff like that. But none of us are going to write about how we went to the zoo yeah. um, because, because that's not where we are. And so give us the guidelines and yeah. tell us where to go and then let us form our own things within that area. Yeah. I think um, I always, relationships are, are huge if you're building a brand. I'm a big believer in that. And I think that relationship with your readers um, are super important, but guess what? Your brand relationships are just if not more important. And I want to get on le personal levels with them. I want to know about them. I want to be best friends with them because if they love me, I'm going to get content from them. And it's like residual income, which is what we want, which doesn't really happen in the blog world. I mean, you get campaign to campaign. So what's great is I always try to shoot ideas to them. They might give me creative, but they love communication. Communicate with your brands. Well, here's a couple ideas of what I thought. Um, you don't always have to do that every time, but sometimes I'll do that if I'm initiating a relationship with a brand. Um, or I could even say, well, is there a hashtag you would like me to use? Oh my gosh, you're willing to do that for me, not just use the hashtag sponsored. I would love to add hashtag whatever my brand is, you know? And that's just a little bit of something more that you're giving to them that gives them a little bit of more power that you're willing to do, but yet still gives you the creativity is the only thing that you want anyway, because you're the creator and you're wanting obviously to make it, you know, sincere to you. So brand relationships is so important. I love that point. I think I recommend creators here to really, when it comes to brand connections, pursue partnerships and not just paychecks, right? Yep. When we can develop really strong connections with our influencers, that leads to more opportunities for you, right? I might invite you to an inclusive event or bring you to a celebrity meet and greet that I might not give that same opportunity to people I haven't worked with closely. And I think being able to go to the brand that have got this idea, I'd love to do this, and pitching that to us, we are often open to ideas. And if you can tie that back to, here's what it'll do for your business, for your brand, um, it's really a win-win. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ha how do you get the experience with the product? I mean, you, you're, you're given a product, you're, you're given it to try. Let's assume you don't like it. Now, you still have to feed your family or still whatever you're using, your right? <laughs> so, and you're doing this not just because it's a passion, but there's also a compensation component. What do you do? What do you do when there's um, a product or a service that either one, you don't think fits with your personal brand image mm -hmm. or Alternatively, you, like you know, it. you don't like it. Sure. Well, and you know, if you know up front that something's not going to fit or you're not going to like it or something like that, um, I, I will advocate all day long to say no. 
Um, I actually had this conversation with some, a blogger this week where she turned down monetarily a huge opportunity for her because to her, it was going against things that she believed for her blog. And I said, I told her, I said, look, you've turned this down and so you have, you've held up your own integrity and then ultimately by holding up your integrity, you are building your brand as more value for the next partner that you are going to partner with. Yeah. And so it is a lot about um, finding that balance of things that you believe in and things that you can use and things that you can actually share mm -hmm. from a real standpoint. Now that said, you get things and you think they're going to be great and, and sometimes they're not. And it's okay then to either do one of two things. If, there are thing, if you, there's nothing you good you can say about it, I would personally send it back and say, I'm sorry, there is nothing good I can say about this product because I don't want to write a complete pan you know, review all day long. That would be terrible and nobody would want to read it. On the other hand, if there, you can do that mixed balance like she was talking about with the shoes, having a mixed balance review where you, know, you list all these great positive things, but you know, I wish it had this, or I wish it had this. Mm -hmm. That makes it more real, more genuine, and more believable to people as well. So I mean, there, there definitely is um, that component of you've got to balance that you are trying to make a living doing this, but at the end of the day, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and you have to live up to the brand that you want to put out there for everybody to see. Yeah, and it goes back to what I was saying as far as your readers trusting you with your Absolutely. posts, your sponsored posts. So if you're not posting about everything, but I'm not gonna post about, well, I mean, I still eat cookies, so I probably would post about cookies, but I mean, that's a bad example, but if you're gonna be posting about everything under the sun, they're gonna be so annoyed. It's not true to your brand. So, I mean, not only are your integrity for yourself, for your growth of your brand, but you're gonna get more followers than in that. I mean, you're not yep. gonna find people running away. Your page are gonna continue to increase because of how organic and how real those sponsored posts are, and they don't seem as sponsored if they're more relatable, obviously, to yourself and to your readers. How do you think a brand would react in terms of getting turned down by uh, a creator? Well, I think it's like we said, one thing is that uh, negative feedback is a gift in several ways because you have a chance as a brand to respond to it. So let's say somebody does go ahead and, and give us a negative review. That's a chance for us to say, okay, let me help with that. And uh, you know, again, we've had lots of studies that have shown that uh, when brands respond in an appropriate way and actually make the problem right, it actually turns something negative into something super positive. Yes. And so that's pretty big. Um, and again, I would echo what we were saying before is that a, a tiny bit of, of negativity, because you know it's honest, always helps a little yes. bit. And so when I was on the brand side and I was working with large groups of influencers, I said to them every time I sent anything, I want your true opinion. If you don't like it, you can say it. Yeah. And maybe I'm a, I might be a little bit more liberal than, than most. Um, but they did, and I think it also made our influencers feel very powerful because they weren't just shillers. They yes. were actually, their opinions matter yes. to us. So I said, it's fine to say, I like this trimmer, but I wish it had a hang hole. Um, and in addition to that, we would add a hang hole later. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, it made us very responsive and it made us really connected with consumers. So I, I have never been scared of negative feedback. And I'll say this as well, I really think that influencer marketing is a lot like dating. Right? Sometimes you're just not a fit and that's okay. But I think in the long term, if you find yourself at a place where you're turning down a brand, keep it classy. Right? You never know yeah, where that brand manager right. is going to go, absolutely. where the agency is going to go next. So if you can keep it classy, polite, yeah. keep that dialogue open. A nice breakup. Yeah, there might be a way to work <laughs> nice with that breakup. brand in the future, that person. Um, so you want to keep the dialogue open. Well, and I just really quick, I love the part about positivity because you you don't have to make anything negative negative. You don't at all. In fact, if anything, it could benefit you and the brand. For example, if I'm doing a shoe company and I say, you know what, this running shoe is actually too much cushion because I actually love this minimalist shoe that they offer better because that's just how I am. My feet are low maintenance. Now look at how many different consumers you're bringing into your brand. You're not just using this cushion, great running shoe. You just brought in this CrossFit shoe and you have different consumers. And so now you're going to sell two shoes rather than one. So it's a very, I mean, it can be very good, positive. That's right. Yeah, I think it's really about sharing your, again, honest opinion and experience, right? And if that includes some things that you wish were different or that you want to recommend other people, then that's fair as long as you're being um, above board and fair to the brand if they're compensating you to create that content, right? Totally. You know, one of the things that uh, stuck out this morning in Ryan's presentation on the state of sponsored social was the tremendous disparity 
between awareness of responsibility and obligations between creators and brands. I don't remember the specific numbers, but it was something like two-thirds of creators were aware of their obligations. Um, and the flip side with brands, two-thirds of brands were not aware of their responsibilities. What do you guys attribute that to, Suzanne? Um, you know, I think that, well, we're trying definitely to do our job of making sure that everyone's educated. And I think that we've heard a lot more about these regulations as kind of the digital revolution has carried on. And so I think that, that the trade organizations are going to continue to try to educate folks. And I think it's great that we have forums like this where we can all get together and talk. And we definitely are counting on all of you to help you to use proper disclosure and to help spread the message as well. Um, and it's okay for content providers to go back to the brands because there are, like we talked about earlier, absolutely brands that are not focused on disclosure. Um, they will value you <laughs> if you go back and say, look, we have to use proper disclosure. This is the way that it is. They will respect you. And so, you know, I think it's going to go, I think it's on everybody. It's on the brands to do it. It's on the trade orgs to educate and the, and the regulatory bodies to educate. And it certainly is on the content providers to make sure that we're following all of that. Yeah, I think there's so many reasons why there's that disconnect with brands not being familiar, right? I think a lot of the smaller companies aren't really savvy quite yet with social and how disclosures work. I think in larger companies, there's so many cooks in the kitchen, it's hard to keep them all educated, right? The challenge here is at the end of the day, I didn't know is not a legal defense, so the onus really is on us as brands, as agencies, as creators to stay informed about it. That's right. Okay, if I don't know the speed limit, I'm still going to get a speeding ticket. And so that's what we're going to see happening in this space. Yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of it um, also goes back to that in some cases, marketers and brands have been so used to all of these other forms of marketing, you know, they've grown, everybody's grown up with the newspaper and the TV and all those things that didn't require these regulations, that now that they're shifting to the digital, shifting that mindset of disclosing and all those regulations is, is not quite coming along with it. They just, there's a mm -hmm. lot of Jen, let's, going let's take that point because what you're saying is that they know the rules with respect to traditional media. Mm -hmm. But the FTC says that consumers don't expect sponsored <laughs> social to exist. Right. You know, right. it's, we're almost 10 years into this since uh, uh, Ted's, Ted's video with, uh, you know, hey, proposed. Yeah. You know, is that is that realistic? Yeah. Do consumers not know when someone who has five million followers starts talking about a particular product, or when you and you have your high quality, your high quality, you know, blogs that you're talking about something? I mean, isn't it really what the consumer? What's the consumer reasonably expect? You know, I think in some ways the FTC is naive in thinking that people don't get it. However, as we talked about, there is always somebody who is not going to get that me going like this yeah. is my Fiji water thing, which, by the way, I'm not compensated by Fiji, but just as an example. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so there, there is this, this disconnect to me because I feel like at this point people should know. I mean, yeah. people, it, it's so in your face that, that people should know, but the bottom line is, is that it doesn't matter whether they should. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that the FTC says you have to. The bottom line is you, you right. should disclose. Yeah. You should want to tell people this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, it may, it may feel, um, it may feel odd or, or that it's not being, you know, completely organic when you first start doing it. But if you've been doing this for long enough, and, and I have been doing this for long enough, and I've disclosed since the beginning, although my forms of disclosure have changed as the rules have changed, um, it, it just becomes part of the natural conversation. You know, if you went to your best friend yeah. and you said, hi, I'm going to serve you Fiji water today. She'd be like, are you crazy? Like, what's going on? But you could say, hey, Fiji sent me all this great water and we're trying it out. And then you become part of the conversation and, and just disclosing part yeah. becomes part of it. But I think what I see is when I talk to people outside of the industry, they really don't understand how creators make a living, right? I work for a Fortune 500 company in social media. My mom doesn't understand what I do or how I can pay my rent doing this, <laughs> right? So I think it's fair to say a lot of consumers don't understand it. And so it's really important to us to keep them protected by having those disclosures, I think. But I think the, you know, what I took from the state of sponsored, state of sponsored social 
report was also that it really didn't matter to consumers, right? The most important thing that mattered yes. to them was sincerity. Yes, yep. and, absolutely. And that's, and that's uh, the key thing. Yeah. You know, as, as someone once told me, sincerity is the most important thing. Once you learn to yes. fake that, it's yes. all downhill from there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about working with celebrities? Um, you know, the, the, the mommy bloggers and the fitness bloggers, they're going to need to disclose. A lot of times, celebrities don't, don't disclose. When do you think that a celebrity should disclose the relationship and should otherwise be bound by that? I mean, you saw with, with, with Kim Kardashian, the claim she'd made triggered a responsibility on the drug company. But how about the obligation to disclose? Um, Coca-Cola works with Taylor Swift, right? But they also work with Vine stars that have five million followers. You know, when is there an obligation to, to disclose that you think for a celebrity? Well, I love working with celebrities. Uh, we recently sponsored a major award ceremony in June and sponsored a, a national tour with a top pop artist, which was fantastic. Um, so at Cricket, we do require our celebrities to also disclose when they're posting um, that it's hashtag sponsored or that we're sponsoring them, so it's super clear. But I've seen other major brands. There's one um, huge sports apparel company, and their take on it is if so-and-so is appearing in my TV spot, it's still clear and conspicuous we have a paid relationship, so she doesn't need to disclose an ad. I think as long as you're working to be, um, again, clear and transparent, that's the goal, and different companies approach it differently. Mm -hmm. Suzanne? Uh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, obviously, uh, the big stars, the big celebrities are definitely obligated to disclose. I think maybe even more than most because in some cases they carry more influence. So um, it goes back to that whole thing of building that bridge of trust with consumers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sadie, you talked about contests before. Yes. You mentioned contests. So what, what impact do you think our contests have? Again, are you getting product, product, something given from the sponsor that should be disclosed? And what other legal sources do you think you need to check besides the uh, platform's guidelines? Well, I mean, the brands can, break, can give your policies as well as far as like the guidelines with that. Andrew? And then, sorry. No, nope, you're fine. I know you guys can't see the monitor. Sorry, guys, but uh, one minute warning because we're we're over. We're so over. Just, okay. Wow. Sorry, I know it's so exciting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Of the disclosure. Just read, read all the crap and you'll figure it out. Just kidding. 